Okay, percentage yield. We'll start this lesson off by thinking of an analogy here where we take two slices of bread and one slice of cheese to make one sandwich. So let's imagine then that you are having friends over and you have eight slices of bread and six slices of cheese. How many sandwiches will you be able to make? Pause the video, figure that out, write it down, and then start again. Start the video. Okay, so hopefully you determined with the ratio being two to one to one, that for every two slices of bread, we need one slice of cheese, and that will form one sandwich. So with the amount of bread and cheese we have, we can form four sandwiches, leaving two slices of cheese left over. Okay, so let's imagine you're planning to make these sandwiches, and as you are starting to make the sandwiches, your little sibling or cousin runs in and steals some bread from your pile, and now, oops, you know, what if you only have four slices of bread? So how many sandwiches will you be able to actually make if you only have four slices of bread? So hopefully you determined with just four slices of bread that you were actually only able to make two sandwiches. So we were expecting to make four sandwiches, but someone stole the bread and now we are only able to make two sandwiches. And so the concept of percent yield as it works in this analogy would be the idea of taking the two sandwiches that we actually made when we made the sandwiches and the four that we were expecting to make and say we're really only to make two we were able to make two out of the four we were expecting. And so two out of four times 100, so two out of four expressed as a percent would be 50%. So we would say that that reaction would proceed with 50% yield. So that's the basic concept. We're gonna, going to apply it to a chemistry example soon. I just wanna ask you to think through a couple of other scenarios here. Going back to our original eight slices of bread and six slices of cheese, what now if you only have five slices of cheese? So how does that change the number of sandwiches that we're able to make? So if you only have five slices of cheese now. Okay, so we see that with only five slices of cheese, because cheese was in excess to begin with, having five slices of cheese or six slices of cheese really didn't affect being able to make the four sandwiches. Here I modeled the eight slices of bread with only five slices of cheese, and you'll see that the excess reagent is still the cheese. And so in part A, when we decreased the limiting reagent, we decreased our actual yield, which decreased our percent yield. When we decreased the excess reagent, but not enough to make it limiting, then that didn't change the amount of product, and so we maintained a good yield at 100%. Okay, what if you have only three slices of cheese? What does that do to the number of sandwiches you can make and therefore the percent yield? Okay, and so you can see that in decreasing the cheese to the point of having only three slices, we actually, the cheese actually became the limiting reagent and we can only produce three sandwiches which now produces a yield of 75%. And so the concept of percent yield is really just about comparing the actual yield to what we call the theoretical yield. And so instead of counting slices of cheese or bread, when we do these chemistry questions, we're going to be looking at the mass of the product. So very clearly here, the mass of the product is what we call the yield. A theoretical yield would be the mass of the product determined by the stoichiometric calculation. So remember your mass to moles to moles to mass. The actual yield is the mass obtained by experiment. So both of these are the mass of the product, right? One is predicted by the calculation and one is obtained by experiment. And so we relate those two just as we did in the sandwich analogy where the actual yield is the numerator, theoretical yield is the denominator, and we multiply by 100 to express, express it as a percent. So the most straightforward application of this formula would be a question where you're given both the theoretical yield and the actual yield. So as you read this question, identify the theoretical yield, actual yield, and then use the formula to calculate the percent yield.
Okay, so 4.20 was defined as the theoretical yield and 3.10 grams of the precipitate was produced in an actual experiment. So there's our actual yield. Dividing those, multiply by 100, we finish with 73.8% yield. Okay, in example two, I'm giving you a little bit more work to do here. The goal is the same, determine the percent yield of the reaction. So 4.66 grams of calcium chloride reacts with 5 grams of sodium carbonate in aqueous solution. 3.10 grams of precipitate is collected during this investigation. So determine the percent yield. So as you read this question, you can see a chemical change is occurring. So I would start with a balanced equation, list your given, and start to think about how you would map out the problem. And once you've done that, start the video again just to see if you're on the right track. Okay, so hopefully you've written a balanced chemical equation and you notice the ratio is 1 to 1 to 1 to 2. That final product there is aqueous and we've identified the precipitate as calcium carbonate. We were told the masses of the solutes, calcium chloride and sodium carbonate to start and that 3.10 grams is collected during the investigation. So that's the actual yield. The theoretical yield is unknown and we've been asked to determine the percentage yield. So we have the formula in mind, actual yield over theoretical times 100. So we have the actual, we just need the theoretical yield, which again is predicted by stoichiometric calculation. So we have two masses of the reactants. One of these will fully react, the other will be excess. Which one is the limiting reagent? And what mass of calcium carbonate does that is predicted to form then? So really we're looking to first find the theoretical yield, and then knowing the actual and theoretical yield, we'll be able to calculate the percent yield. So if you're um, up to speed on your limiting reacting calculations, then um, try this problem and check back with the video. Okay, so I first converted the ma given masses to moles, and that is what I now have of each reagent available. What do I need? Well, I notice the ratio is 1 to 1, so having 0 0.04199 moles of calcium chloride means I would need the same amount of sodium carbonate. Do I have enough? Yes, in fact, I have extra. So therefore, this reagent, the sodium carbonate, is present in excess, which makes the calcium chloride limiting. So now I can use the amount of the limiting reagent in order to determine the amount of the calcium carbonate and in turn the mass of the calcium carbonate, which is the theoretical yield. Okay, and so you'll see I used the mole ratio from calcium chloride to calcium carbonate and the molar mass of calcium carbonate to determine the theoretical yield of 4.20 grams. And just like before, having the actual yield and the theoretical yield plugged into this formula yields 73.8%. Okay, so just to summarize, in terms of the types of questions, the first example, you were given actual yield and theoretical yield and asked to determine the percent yield. In the second example, I didn't give you the theoretical yield, but I gave you the masses of the reactants. So you determined which was the limiting reagent and in turn were able to figure out the theoretical yield and then use the actual yield and the theoretical yield to determine the percentage yield. A third type of question, and perhaps, perhaps the trickiest, is when you're given the percent yield and the actual yield and asked to find the mass of the reactant. So I'll set up an example like that using the same reaction that we've been using, and you can see how this works. So the question would look like this. The formation of calcium carbonate from calcium chloride and sodium carbonate proceeds with 73.8% yield. What mass of calcium chloride would be required to produce 3.10 grams of the precipitate? So you'll notice that we've been given the percent yield and told that we're looking to produce 3.10 grams of the precipitate. So to produce that means to physically hold that in your hands at the end of the experiment. So that is the actual yield. And we need to figure out then the mass of one of the reactants, in this case the calcium chloride. So start with a balanced equation and see if you can map out how to do this calculation. So I've written a balanced equation and listed under the calcium carbonate the actual yield that was provided. I don't know the theoretical yield, but we were given the percent yield. And under the calcium chloride, I'm looking for the mass of that reactant. 
So if I think about it, I do have a relationship, right? The percent yield formula relates actual and theoretical yield. So knowing the percent yield and actual yield, I could determine the third variable in that formula, the theoretical yield. And once I know the theoretical yield, I can work my way back from mass to moles to moles to mass of the calcium chloride. You might be thinking, why don't we just take the mass of the calcium carbonate that's physically produced, the actual yield? Well, because this isn't 100% yield, it means that if we target to try to produce 3.10 grams, so in other words, start with a mass that's going to produce 3.10 grams according to the calculation, then we're going to fall short. We're not actually going to produce 3.10 grams. We're only going to get about 74% of that. And so we have to aim higher, aim for the theoretical yield, start with a mass that by calculation should predict a higher value, and then because of the 73.8% yield, we'll only produce the 3.10 grams, which was the target in the first place. So let's give that a shot. So in the first step, I write down the formula that relates percent yield, actual yield, and theoretical yield, and now I'm going to manipulate the equation to isolate the theoretical yield because that's what I'm looking to calculate from this formula. So if right now theoretical yield is in the denominator. If I multiply it on both sides, then it will not be in the denominator anymore. And now I'm looking at theoretical yield times the percent yield equals the actual yield times 100. And looking to isolate theoretical yield, if I can divide by percent yield on both sides, then that will cancel the percent yield. And so I'll finish with theoretical yield equals the actual yield times 100 over the percent yield. So I'll go ahead and substitute my values here and generate the theoretical yield. So you'll see I come up with the 4.20 grams maintaining the sig figs of the actual yield. And now that I know the actual, now that I know the theoretical yield, I can use my mass to moles to moles to mass to calculate the mass of calcium chloride. Okay, and so I move from mass of calcium carbonate to moles of calcium carbonate to moles of calcium chloride to the grams of calcium chloride, which is what I was asked for, the mass of the reactant. So I purposely, in these three examples, worked with the same equation so that you could see that 4.66 grams of calcium chloride reacted with some sodium carbonate to form precipitate. Now, the theoretical yield of that calcium carbonate was 4.20 grams, but because the actual yield is not 100%, we ended up with only 3.10 grams. That percent yield was 73.8%. And of course, the NaCl was also a product. So this was our solid, so that's what we were focused on. So remember, actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100 gives us the percent yield. And there's lots of different ways that we can manipulate this data in different types of questions. Okay, so the last part of the lesson is just considering sources of lower percent yield. So in other words, what actually happens in a chemical reaction so that the actual yield doesn't end up being equal to the theoretical yield? So impure reactants are one of the uh, possible sources of lower percent yield. If you think you have 10 grams of a substance reacting, but it's not 100% pure, then perhaps you only have 9.95 grams reacting. Well, there's no way you're going to produce an actual yield as high as if you had 10 grams reacting. So it's definitely going to lead to lower, lower actual yields, which when you consider the formula for percent yield, your numerator is now lower, that's going to lower your percentage yield. So when the actual yield is lower, we'll have a lower percent yield. If you have competing reactions, so something that is occurring in the reaction vessel at the same time as the reaction you're trying to, do, to have occur, if something else is happening that's using up one of the reagents and it's not being directed towards the product that you're interested in, that's going to lower the actual yield, which will also lower the percent yield.
Now, experimental interlayer can work two ways. Um, it could actually lower the percent yield or it could even raise the percent yield. In our precipitate, uh, precipitate formation example, if someone was collecting a precipitate on filter paper and didn't dry the precipitate and filter paper completely, then that remaining water would add mass and perhaps your actual yield would end up possibly even higher than the calculated theoretical yield. And that would lead to an even higher percent yield than 100%. Usually though, with experimental error, we find that it leads to reduced actual yields um, and therefore lower percent yield. But really, this could go either way. Um, you, you know, the example of the precipitate or filter paper still being wet is an, is an example of when the error could actually raise the percent yield. So this is, these are some reasons why we see actual yields be lower than what the stoichiometric calculations predict.